Hello, welcome back. Okay, reaction types. So two things that we have to do in this, and I actually sometimes think that uh, not identifying reaction types, but using reagents to predict what type of products you're going to get based upon these reaction types tend to be a little harder for students than the actual calculations. So two things here. One, can you classify a reaction into one of these five categories synthesis decomposition combustion single displacement and double displacement we're also going to add something called an acid base neutralization which is a lot like double displacement and we're going to add a redox reaction which is in chapter 25 however i want you to know that although these are the main categories for reactions the more complicated the structure the more complicated the reaction. So there are actually thousands of different types of reactions. Again, these are just the main categories. So I'm going to go through each category, give you some notes, and then we're going to talk about predicting products. All right, let's start here. Now I would pause for each of these and write the notes that's on the slide. Uh, in order to be able to predict products, first thing you have to do is you have to identify what type of reaction. So we're going to write number one there. Determine the reaction type. So we're going to start with the first reaction, which is synthesis. Now, synthesis is a very general concept. It's about taking particles and then combining them together to make one material. So it could be elements combining to make a compound, or it could be an element and a compound combining, or multiple compounds combining to make one large molecule. We're going to emphasize at this level elements combining to make a compound. So first thing, the general structure for this. If we had a generalized form, we would say, let's take uh, chemical A and chemical B, and let's combine them into one structure. So a good example of this would be, let's take hydrogen and oxygen and combine them to make a water molecule. So now I just have to go back and balance this. There you go, two moles of hydrogen plus a mole of oxygen produces two moles of water, it yields two moles of water. All right, so they're pretty easy to identify. Again, uh, the ones we're gonna emphasize are going to be element one plus element two is gonna give us our new compound. So suppose they give you something like this on a test. We're gonna take um, aluminum and we're going to react oxygen and then they want to know hey what are the products of this reaction going to be so in order to combine them into a compound we have to know the charge numbers so we look up aluminum on the periodic table it has a positive 3 charge we look up oxygen group 16 has a negative 2 charge and so now we're going to do our crisscross method and that means our compound has to be Al2O3. We're going to write that in. Now, once we predict the product, then we go back and we balance the equation. So I'm going to do uh, three of these, two of these, and four of these. Let's see if that's right. Four aluminums on each side, six oxygens on each side. So there is my balanced equation predicted from the two elements. Okay, those aren't so bad. Second type is almost the exact opposite. We're going to take one component and we're going to break it up into simpler components. Again, it could be one large compound breaks up into two smaller compounds, or it could be a compound breaks up into a new compound and an element. But we're going to emphasize only the ones where we take a compound and break it down into elements. So the general form is the exact reverse process. Start with AB and break it down into A plus B. Good example of that would be, let's take our water and let's zap it with electricity. E minus, where does that come from? E stands for electrons. Minus, electrons have a negative charge. The movement of electrons is what we call electricity. And we broke it up into hydrogen and oxygen, H2 and O2. Now, why H2 instead of H? Why O2 instead of O? And this is where we have to go back to the beginning of the course. Remember, I said that certain elements combine together 
to make molecules that are diatomic or polyatomic. And it just so happens if we're going to break water up into its elements, we produce diatomic hydrogen and diatomic oxygen. So you're going to have to go back and memorize which elements are diatomic and which are my two, my two, like I own them, which are the two that are polyatomic. So again, general form, we're going to take a compound and we're going to break it apart into its elements. Let's say if it's binary, then we have element one and element two, dot, 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 however many elements we have. If it's ternary, there would be a third element. So let's say we had this. We're going to take uh, nitric acid and we're going to decompose it. That's what they would say in the problem. Now they want you to predict the products and balance the equation. So if it's a decomposition, we're going to break this up into elements. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and we got to say to ourselves, all right, is hydrogen a monatomic, diatomic, or polyatomic? Well, it just so happens hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen are all diatomic. So we're going to write that as our product, H2, N2, plus O2. Now we go back and we balance the equation. I'm going to start with the oxygen, which we have the most of. And then I can go back and we're done. So there's our balanced equation. So predicting products for synthesis and decomposition isn't so bad. You just have to know which elements are diatomic and polyatomic. And you're just breaking things apart into its proper elements for decomposition. Third type of reaction is also easy to predict products. If you have a combustion reaction, now do understand not all burning is combustion. Um, combustion, you have to have a particular fuel and oxygen, and the products are always carbon dioxide and water. Remember, carbon dioxide and water are strong driving forces on our planet. So the fuel can either be a hydrocarbon methane, ethane, propane, so I'll put C3H8 for propane, or it could be a carbohydrate. And carbohydrates were those that had the empirical formula of CH2O. So for instance, glucose, C6H12O6. So suppose on a test they say, let's do the combustion of glucose. They want you to predict the products, balance the equation. All right, so glucose is C6H12O6, and it's combustion. So if it's combustion, that means we need oxygen in which to burn it, and we're always going to produce carbon dioxide and water. So it's pretty easy. We just have to go back and balance it. I'm going to start with the hydrogens, because there's 12 on the left side, and that's going to give me eight oxygens on both sides. Um, but we got to balance the carbon. So there's six carbons. So now we have a total of 12, 18 oxygens on the right. We already have six from the glucose. So that leaves 12. We need to put a six in front of the oxygen. There you go. Balanced equation. So the first three are not difficult. Now, one of the things I said in the first video uh, was that when things react, they can switch materials. So single displacement and double displacement are reactions in which we're switching materials between the two uh, compounds um, or a compound and an element. Sometimes they call these metathesis reactions, single metathesis and double metathesis. Now, the difference between the two is that single metathesis only involves one compound. Double metathesis involves two compounds. So some students mess this up. They both involve a switch, but double displacement does not involve two switches. If you switch your left hand with your right hand and then switch it back again, right hand to left hand, then you're right back where you started from. There's no such thing as a double switch. So single displacement is a switch between one compound and an element. So let's write the general form for that. We're gonna get an element one, and compound one, and we're gonna have something switch so that we get a new element, let's call that element two, and compound two. 
Now there's two types of these. There's a metal signal displacement where you have a metal, let's call it chemical A, and then you have a compound, BC. Now you're going to switch the metals. Now the metals are the positively charged ones, so what we're going to do is we're going to switch A and B. And so when you predict the products, B becomes the element and A connects to C. Now, the problem with this is you have to make sure that you create the correct formula. Let me show you. What if we had, I don't know, let's do um, silver, and we're going to react it with magnesium chloride. Okay. And now we got to predict the products. Well, the only reaction where we have an element reacting with a compound is a single, single displacement, so we're going to switch the silver and the magnesium. Now, magnesium is a monatomic element, so we just write Mg. However, silver has a charge of positive 1. So it's going to take one silver and one chloride to produce the new compound. So the compound is not AgCl2. The compound is actually AgCl. You have to have the correct formula. Now we can go back and we can balance this. We have two chlorines on both sides, and that means I got to put a two in front of the silver. So that would be a metal displacement. Another example would be a non-metal switch. And in a non-metal switch, you get something like A plus BC, but A is now a non-metal. So it's going to switch with the other non-metal. So you get C plus BA. So if it's a non-metal switch, switch the metals. If it's a metal switch, switch the non-metals. Make sure your charges are correct. Example for the non-metal switch. Suppose we have a chlorine. Notice, diatomic element, one of the special ones. And we're going to react it with uh, sodium bromide. Predict the products, balance the equation. So this is a single switch between the non-metals. So now bromine becomes the element, and sodium chloride becomes the compound. Now, why did I only put one chloride with the sodium? Well, what's the charge on sodium always? Na+. What's the charge on chlorine in group 17? Cl minus. So the formula has to be NaCl, not NaCl2. So you're not just taking the symbols <coughs> that are listed and then smacking them together. They have to come together so that their oxidation numbers add up to be zero. And then this Br, bromine. Is it a special diatomic element? Yes, it is. So I'm going to put a subscript 2. And then I'm going to go back and balance the equation. There you go. fifth type, something called double metathesis, and this one's actually pretty easy to do, I think. It, what you do is they're going to give you two compounds, and then you're going to switch the metals, and when you write the products, just make sure that the charges balance. For instance, first of all, general form, we're going to take compound AB plus CD, and then we're going to switch the two metals, A and C, and that's going to give us CB plus AD. Okay, fine. So this would be compound 1 plus compound 2. We switch them and we get a new compound. Let's call that compound 3 and compound 4. Okay, so suppose they gave you this on a test and they wanted you to predict the products and balance the equation. They're going to give you a reaction between, let's do sodium chloride and let's do lead to nitrate. All right. So what are the products? Balance the equation. Okay, first of all, let's write the formulas for the reactants. 
If we're dealing with sodium, it's a group 1 metal, so we do Na+. And chlorine is a group 17, so we do Cl-. Lead 2, they're telling us what the charge is. It's 2+. Plus. That's what the Roman numeral 2 means. And then nitrate, one of the ones we memorized, that has negative 1 charge. So we're going to switch the metals to get our products. So push the sodium with the lead. Okay. <coughs> Pardon me. So now I'm ready to write my equation. Sodium chloride, Na balances the Cl. Lead to nitrate, I'm going to need two nitrate groups to balance the charge on the lead. Produces. Now I'm going to switch the lead and the nitrate. So here's what I'm doing. I'm saying, all right, I'm starting out with Na, Cl. I'm starting out with Pb2+, starting out with nitrate, and then... Then I'm going to switch them. I'm going to put the lead with the chloride. Now, how much, how many chloride atoms do I need or ions to balance this? I need two. So I'm going to write PbCl2. And then I'm going to combine the sodium with the nitrate. But they both have a one charge, so they're balanced already. NaNO3. Now I go back and balance the equation. I need two nitrate groups on both sides. I need two sodiums and two chlorides on both sides. There you go. There's your balanced equation. All right. It takes practice. It's not intuitive. All right, I want to come back to the metal activity series and the solubility chart in just a moment. Let's see what we're up to in our slideshow. All right, so first we said there are five major types of reactions in Chapter 9. And for synthesis, you're, we're going to focus on the only type of synthesis we're going to do at this level is take elements, put them together to predict a compound. And for decomposition, the only decomposition reaction we're going to do is take a compound and break it up into its elements. But for both of them, you have to be aware of which elements are diatomic and which ones are polyatomic. All the rest are monatomic. Combustion is when we take a fuel with oxygen and then it produces carbon dioxide and water. So they're pretty easy. But I would go back and make sure that you know the formulas for hydrocarbons. So methane, ethane, propane, butane. And remember the formula is if you know the number of carbons, take the hydrogens, multiply them by two and add two. So butane means four carbons. So our formula is gonna be C4, two times four plus two is 10. So C4H10. Single displacement is when a metal switches with the metal and a metal element switches with the metal in a compound or the non-metal element switches with the non-metal in a compound now we're going to go back and we're going to do the honors level because again remember we're supposed to teach you the honors for those that are going to take ap classes but we're not going to test you on the honors level um is to use the activity series to determine whether there is a reaction or not i will come back to that in a moment double displacement Take your two compounds, come up with the formulas, and then switch charges. And then the honors level would be to predict which of those two turn into a precipitate. A uh, precipitate is the driving force of a double displacement reaction. Okay, and then we have a couple of examples at the end. So let me go back and copy these examples that I wanted to go over. And I'll put them in my little slideshow. Okay. Let's go back and take a look at the activity series. As it turns out on your periodic table, and we'll discuss why later in the course, if this is a drawing of my periodic table, then the elements towards the edges, not the noble gases, but the elements towards the edges tend to be highly reactive. So our most reactive elements are going to be group 1, group 2, and then group, seven, or group 16 and group 17 tend to be the most reactive. The ones in the middle tend to be fairly unreactive. In fact, if we look at this column right here, 
It has copper, it's got silver, and it has gold in it. Why are they in the same column? Well, they have similar chemical reactivities. If we were to take a metal from group one and drop it in water, it would explode. So we don't make coins out of potassium or lithium or sodium metal because if you get sweaty, you burst into flames. So we make them out of copper, we make them out of silver, we make them out of gold because these are fairly unreactive metals. Now they will react with some things, but they don't react with water. All right, so if we were to rank the materials and we would give you this chart, um, the most reactive of the metals listed here is lithium and the least reactive is gold. So we make wires out of copper, silver, gold. We make pots and pans out of copper. We don't make them out of lithium because they would explode when they come in contact with water. Now, if something is highly reactive, all right, at the top, these are reactive. These are much less reactive. So the higher you up on the higher you are up on the chart, the more likely you're going to react. And in a single displacement reaction, you are going to become a compound. So in other words, lithium, potassium, barium, calcium, sodium, magnesium, those things tend to be more stable when they're compounds. Whereas platinum, gold, mercury, silver, copper tend to be more stable as an element. So again, if you are less reactive, I'm going to call it fairly unreactive. No, let's not. We'll stick with less reactive. If you are less reactive, then your tendency in a single displacement reaction is to become an element. You're more stable as an element, whereas things higher up on the chart are more stable as a compound. Okay, so what do we ask the honors kids to do? Glad you asked. If I gave you a reaction, if I said, all right, let's react aluminum with copper nitrate, copper two nitrate. And we know that the products of this reaction would be copper plus aluminum nitrate. If we did the switches, now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna balance the equation here. Let's make this a three, let's make this a two, which makes this a three and this a two. The question is, which is spontaneous? In other words, which one should occur without us adding energy? Is it the forward process as written? Or is it the reverse process? In other words, will this reaction occur? Good question. So we go to our chart. Where is aluminum? We find aluminum. Aluminum is pretty high on the chart, which means aluminum has a tendency to be a compound. And copper is low on the chart, so it has a tendency to become an element. So when you look at a reaction, the thing higher up on the chart should become the compound, and the thing lower on the chart should become an element. So you have to ask yourself, is that already the case? And the answer is no, that is not already the case here. Aluminum is an element and it tends to want to be a compound. Copper is part of a compound, tends to want to become an element. So I would say that the forward reaction is spontaneous, which means the forward reaction is favorable based upon that chart. And now could we make the reverse reaction happen? Sure, we could put in energy and make the reverse reaction happen. But the forward reaction is the one that's favorable. favorable so we would say yes. This reaction, as written, does occur. And that's all they want you to do. So what I'll probably do on the multiple choice is I'll put an extra credit question in there. I know you love extra credit. All you have to do is use the activity series. If it's higher up, it should be a compound. Now, let me show you the exact opposite of that. What if we had something like this where we have silver reacting with sodium chloride <coughs> that would produce sodium chloride I'm sorry silver chloride and sodium all right so now we go to our activity series will this reaction occur and we look sodium is really high 
wants to be a compound. Whereas silver is low on the chart, wants to be an element. Let's look what we have. Well, look, silver is already an element. So is there any thermodynamic force? Is there any reason why this would want to become silver chloride? And the answer is no, it's already an element. Sodium chloride already combined into a compound. So in this case, we would say the forward reaction does not occur. And that would mean that the reverse process is spontaneous, or at least favorable. Spontaneity depends upon where you are in the universe, so it depends upon other factors. But for now, let's say the factors are correct. And we would say a reaction between silver chloride and sodium would occur, but not a reaction between silver and sodium chloride. And then the last part for the honors level. If you have a double displacement reaction, you're going to predict the precipitate by looking at the solubility rules. If something is insoluble, that means it becomes a precipitate. All right, so suppose we had this reaction. We're gonna do, uh, let's do, again, I'm gonna go lead nitrate. We'll use the reaction we used before. Lead nitrate plus uh, let's do sodium chloride produces lead chloride plus sodium nitrate. And then we just go back and we balance this equation. Okay, so what's our precipitate? Okay, we look at the chart. First rule, anything that has a group one metal in it, sodium, potassium, or ammonium, which we haven't studied. Well, it's one of the ones I asked you to memorize, so I'll take that off. If you have a group one metal or ammonium, these are always soluble. They can never be a compound. See, are soluble. So when I look at this, I say, look at my products. This has a group one metal in it. So this cannot be the precipitate. further, if we look at the chart, all nitrates are soluble. So again, we go back to this chart, cannot be the precipitate. Well, we already said sodium nitrate can't be the precipitate because of the sodium ion. So now we look at the rule for lead chloride. All right, so we find chlorides on the chart, and it turns out that lead chloride, really? Lead chloride is only slightly soluble. If something is slightly soluble, it means it's mostly insoluble. So if it's mostly insoluble, it's the lead chloride that is producing the precipitate. So I'm going to show that by putting an S next to it for solid. And that's it. That's all there is to that. That's really not hard. We would give you the activity series. We would give you the solubility chart and I'm gonna put that on there as extra credit. All right, so let's do these reactions real quick. Predict the products of the reaction between sodium and calcium hydroxide. All right, so we write Na for sodium because it's monatomic. And then calcium hydroxide. Calcium is a positive two charge. Hydroxide's a negative one charge. So I gotta write the proper formula. Then I say to myself, what type of reaction is this? Single displacement. Is the sodium a metal or non-metal? It's a metal, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch the metals to get to my product. Now, calcium is monatomic, so I just write Ca. Now, sodium is a positive one charge in group one, so when it combines with hydroxide, you get NaOH, so there's my products, calcium, sodium hydroxide, now I go back and I balance the equation, and I am done. Second one, synthesis of phosphoric acid from its elements. All right, so it's a synthesis reaction. 
So I have to know what phosphoric acid is. Phosphoric acid comes from H+, like all acids, and it comes from phosphate. So the formula is three hydrogens to balance out the phosphate. So I already know that I'm going to be synthesizing H3PO4. So it comes from the elements hydrogen, phosphorus, and oxygen. Is hydrogen a special diatomic or polyatomic? Yes. Is phosphorus? Yes. Is oxygen? Yes, they all are. So now we're going to take the one with the most atoms. I'm going to use the phosphorus, although it's a tie. I'm going to put a four out in front of H3PO4. And then that gives me 12 hydrogen, so I'm going to put a six in front of H2. And then it gives me 16 oxygen, so I'm going to put an eight in front of O2. And I am now done. Fourth, the reaction between potassium chloride and mercury nitrate. Okay, I can do that. Mercury 2 nitrate, I'm sorry. Potassium chloride, K plus, Cl minus. Mercury 2, and then nitrate, NO3 minus. All right, so if I'm doing potassium chloride, those charges balance. Remember, potassium's group 1, it's always positive 1. Chloride is negative 1 because it's in group 17, and mercury is not abbreviated MG. What is wrong with me? It's HG. All right, so I knew that was positive too because it's written in Roman numerals. So I'm gonna need two nitrates to balance that charge. Now, when I predict the products, I take the positive from the first one, put it with the negative from the second one. So I get KNO3. I take the positive from the second one, put it with the first one. So I get two chlorines to balance that charge. And now I just go back and balance my equation. Done. Last one. Combustion of heptane. Heptane is seven carbons. And so I have to double and add two to get the hydrogens. I'm going to react it with diatomic oxygen because it's an element, so it's O2. And that's always going to produce carbon dioxide and water. Now I just go back and balance it. 16 hydrogens, 7 carbons, 22 oxygens. I'm done.